peace and the mercy and blessings of God be with all of you. I'm your brother in faith, Shabir Ali. Today I will discuss uh, the Holy Spirit in uh, the Gospel according to John. So please uh, uh, stay with me for this. Let me just pay attention to your comments and make sure that everything is looking right. Let me know if my video and audio are all set uh, for your convenience and uh, viewing and listening pleasure. And uh, then we will get uh, started. So basically, I want to uh, look systematically uh, in, at, at the Bible. I've looked at the Old Testament presentation of the Holy Spirit. I've been looking in past videos uh, at uh, the uh, New Testament, and uh, I've been segmenting the New Testament into various uh, portions, uh, looking at, uh, for example, the presentation in uh, the Synoptic Gospels, and then Acts of the Apostles, uh, following from the Synoptic Gospels. And now, uh, we, today, we will be looking at the Gospel according to John. So I see George uh, Ben Amr saying, Assalamu Alaikum, and Dennis uh, assuring me that everything is fine. So let me proceed then. So, in the name of God, the Beneficent, uh, the Merciful One. When we look at the Gospel according to John, we see that uh, the Holy Spirit is uh, mentioned uh, uh, for, for the most part of the Gospel according to John uh, less than, than we find, for example, in Acts of the Apostles um, uh, and uh, in, in, in the Gospel according to, to Luke. In, in Luke, we find a saturation of the, uh, the mention of the Holy Spirit. Um, it, it is there throughout the, the Gospel. In the Gospel according to John, it is sporadic until we get to the final discourse of Jesus. Uh, there we find in John chapters 14, 15, and 16, uh, there is the prominent mention of one who is to come after Jesus. Uh, he is uh, referred to by a Greek term, parakletos, and because of the difficulty in translating this term in a consistent manner wherever it occurs, mm, some translators uh, decide and commentators decide to just simply uh, retain the word uh, parakletos, uh, they retain it often in an, an English equivalent uh, or an anglicized pronunciation, uh, uh, paraclete. Uh, but, uh, and, and so we find the paraclete prominently mentioned there in uh, the, 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 these three chapters of John's Gospel, but outside of these three chapters uh, there is less mention. Still, there is significant mention and we should uh, get on with uh, looking at these uh, instances one after another. So in, in John, um, at the beginning, we have uh, John the Baptist uh, bearing testimony that uh, he didn't uh, know Jesus at first, but he was given a sign that uh, the one on whom uh, the Holy Spirit uh, descends and remains, uh, that one is the Lamb of God, and uh, he is the one who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one who is mightier uh, than John the Baptist, who comes after him, who, who John the Baptist is not... Uh, uh, fit to uh, stoop down and untie his uh, shoelaces. And so that's the Holy Spirit coming down uh, in, in Luke's Gospel. According to, according to Luke's Gospel, the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove. Uh, here, John the Baptist uh, can testify that he saw the Holy Spirit, which um, uh, came in, in some form in which John the Baptist could obviously see him. Uh, in um, uh, going a little further, we find in John chapter 3 that uh, Jesus is speaking uh, to, uh, is it Nathaniel? And uh, Jesus is telling him that you have to be born again. And uh, Nathaniel says, uh, well, you know, um, how can I, is it Nathaniel or Nicodemus? Some, somebody's got to correct me here. Um, obviously, I don't know everything about the Bible. So, in any case, Jesus is speaking to this Israelite and telling him, you have to be born again. And the Israelite says, well, how can I be born again? Like, you know, does that mean I have to get into my mother's womb and come back out, uh, being born one more time? Uh, but uh, Jesus uh, starts to explain that, uh, you know, being born again means you have to be born of the Spirit, because the Spirit begets Spirit and the flesh begets flesh. It's a very interesting statement because it uh, makes you wonder about the begetting of Jesus and uh, how, how did Jesus' physical form uh, come into being because the physical form obviously is from uh, Mary in this case because flesh begets flesh and then the f spiritual form of Jesus must be 
uh, or the spiritual aspect of Jesus must be from the Holy Spirit. But then, if that is the case, uh, what about the rest of humankind? What about our spirit? Where does that come from? Uh, so, uh, to be consistent, you might want to say that uh, Jesus does not need the Holy Spirit to give birth to him. Um, but, but nonetheless, this is uh, in, in these references, I'm trying to uh, uh, zoom in on one particular issue. Is, is the Holy Spirit, as presented in these documents, a separate and distinct person from the Father and the Son uh, as the third person of the Holy Trinity? And remember that uh, Trinitarians hold that there are three persons uh, that share the same uh, divine substance. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that these three are one, but each, each one is God. And uh, we, we can see that in these uh, uh, presentations, uh, the Holy Spirit is actually uh, shown to be something that is, uh, in a way, um, it's an impersonal force. It is something that moves people to action. It is something that affects changes in the world, uh, but uh, and, and it somehow comes from God, but, but this is never called God. A, a, a curious and interesting thing is that, like, let's say we were able to uh, put uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in a lineup. Um, and, and if we ask the Trinitarian Christian to identify these, Trinitarian Christ, Christian, true to his faith or her faith, would say, this is God the Father, this is God the Son, this is God the Holy Spirit. Uh, so the term God is applied to each one of them equally, uh, although each one has a, uh, a unique description uh, or, or designation that distinguishes one from the other. But each one is called God. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You hear the term God, God, God for each one of them. But uh, in, in, in the New Testament, you, you, you don't find the term God applied like this to the Holy Spirit. You don't find God the Holy Spirit. Uh, you find the Spirit of God, or simply the Spirit, or the Holy Spirit. So why, why doesn't the New Testament identify the three as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? Why, why is it that the term God is applied uh, to the Father, and, uh, and, and the Son is called the Son of God, and the Spirit is called the Spirit of God, but, but not just simply God the Spirit? So we find here that uh, in, in John chapter 3, where there's this description about being born again, uh, there is uh, the mention that uh, the Spirit blows, and, uh, and, and where the wind blows, one does not know. And, and here we find the use of the term panuma, which means, can mean spirit and can mean wind, uh, used in, a, in, a, in a, almost like a pun on the word. Uh, to instead of using it here in the for, in the ter, in in the meaning of the um, as a spirit, it's being used almost in the meaning as wind, something that blows and you don't know where it blows from and where it is blowing to. Of course, this is before modern uh, meteorological uh, studies, but but still. Uh, we uh, know that even in modern times, we may not be able to predict the wind uh, and to understand uh, all of its uh, uh, forces and, uh, and dynamism uh, as much as we would like to. But much more so was the case in the ancient world when people uh, felt that the wind was somewhat mysterious and they associated this with the breath of God. And, uh, and so they thought of the spirit and wind as being some the spirit of God and wind as being somehow um, uh, closely related. And um, in, in the Gospel according to John in chapter 3, speaking about being born again and being uh, of a spiritual nature now, um, that, that means that uh, the human being who is a believer in God and having been born again uh, will have this uh, sort of uh, spiritual nature where, whereby uh, one would become uh, slightly mysterious in a, in a way. That, that, that seems to be the description in John chapter 3. So you can see here that in, in all of this description there is nothing that really identifies the Holy Spirit as uh, a distinct uh, person in, in Godhead. In John chapter 4, Jesus meets uh, the Samaritan woman uh, at the well. And uh, he says that uh, God is spirit. 
And so you must worship uh, God in spirit and truth. So what does it mean to worship God in spirit? So uh, obviously the human has a spirit. So worship God in spirit might mean worship God internally. Or is this a way in which we speak uh, when we say uh, that yet you should put the spirit into things or or there should be the spirit of uh, in something? Um, so worship God in the spirit. What does that exactly mean? It means maybe instead of just having, having outward forms, uh, you internally you're really worshiping God. Is that what it means? So Raymond Brown, uh, the uh, author of this commentary, the Anchor Bible Commentary of the Gospel According to John, um, he struggles with this, and um, he, he thinks he, he cannot just simply mean uh, that it is just internal because uh, Christianity developed, and at the time when John's Gospel was uh, written, uh, Christians were uh, worshipping in, in a public way, and we cannot imagine that John's community was one in which all of this public worship was shunned and people were just told to worship privately and in the spirit. So there must have been a public uh, worship. So what does it mean exactly? Um, and, and, and Raymond Brown uh, offers an explanation that eludes me at the moment, but uh, focusing on our question now, um, we can see the way in which spirit is being used. Spirit is being used for something mysterious and uh, not uh, so much as a designation of a uh, one of the persons in Godhead. So when it says God is spirit, uh, we have to take that in parallel with uh, other statements. For example, in the letters of John, which uh, come after the gospel, we find uh, that God is uh, described in uh, 1 John chapter 1 as uh, light. God is light. And then in, in uh, 1 John chapter 4, God is love. So what does it mean, God is spirit? God is light. God is love. So we see a similar type of parallel construction there. Uh, so God is light. Um, so what does that mean? The Quran says God is the light of the heavens and the earth. But what does that mean? It's a, it's a mysterious statement. But we wouldn't equate God with the light. We wouldn't say, okay, this is light and therefore this is God. No, they, there is a deeper meaning here. So when the Bible says God is light, when the Quran says God is light, uh, we have something here to associate with God, but we don't say this exactly is God. So God is a spirit. Uh, we have some idea here to grasp something about God, um, whether Muslims would say that or not, but thinking about the Christian presentation here in the Gospel according to John, God is a spirit. It gives you some idea about God, something about his mysteriousness uh, and his invisible character to uh, the human unaided eye. Um, but it doesn't mean that we're going to equate God with spirit, just as love. Uh, God is love. So uh, how, how do you uh, explain that grammatically? Because love is uh, an abstract noun, and God is not, it's, that's, to mean, that's to say that God is this abstract noun. No, the, the, the idea of love gives you some idea about God, uh, about his kindness, his generosity, his clemency, his uh, care for humankind. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they, they, the love itself, like love as a phenomenon, if we think about all of the love in the world, add them all up together, this is God. No, it doesn't mean that there is a, you know, this is a matter of identity. So saying that God is spirit is, is not really a statement of identity as we look at the parallel statements. And uh, we do not have any sufficient ground here for thinking that the Holy Spirit is uh, a distinct uh, person. Now, I should pause here and let us think a little bit more about what is meant by a person. So, uh, I mean, we all use computers, and computers are very intelligent, and they respond to our requests and so on. They can even answer questions. Computers can even speak nowadays. But we don't refer to them as persons. They're not individuals uh, in that they don't have uh, a... Uh, mind of their own that can identify themselves and say, uh, you know, have a kind of a self-conscious, uh, a self-consciousness. And uh, this is what we're looking for in terms of the Holy Spirit. With, with Jesus, this is very clear. Jesus is a person. Uh, the, the problem uh, for Trinitarians is to show that Jesus is really God. In, in the case of the Holy Spirit, where the Spirit is uh, shown to be a kind of extension of the power of God into the world, 
then clearly we're dealing here with the power of God. Uh, so there, there's no, there's no um, lack of clarity here that we're dealing with God, but oh, at least an extension of him. Uh, but uh, the, uh, is this a separate and distinct person so we can get three in the Trinity? And this is the problem. To, we cannot find uh, any clear evidence here that we're dealing with a separate and distinct uh, uh, person. Now, a curious uh, reference in the Gospel according to John in regarding the Holy Spirit is John chapter 7, verse number 39, uh, where uh, Jesus is speaking. Is it 39 or is it 59? I have to look that up now. So, uh, Bible Hub, I'm going to put my glasses on and uh, look at uh, that here. John chapter 7. So, John, John chapter 7. I should have asked you and you would have told me right away, but it saved time that way. Uh, 7, verse number, let me see, uh, 39. Yeah, so verse number 39. So he said um, in, in the New International Version, by this he meant the Spirit, uh, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not yet had not been had not been given since Jesus had not been had not yet been glorified. Um, so it says here the Spirit had not been given in this translation. I'm going to look up some other translations and see what uh, interesting varieties we can find here. Uh, so um, not been given and not been given, not yet be given, uh, not yet given. And not yet given, not yet given, not yet given, not yet given. <laughs> it's interesting how many of them say not yet given. And in fact, uh, the uh, the word given here uh, is, uh, is sometimes italicized uh, to um, uh, alert the reader that this is not there in the um, in in the uh, in the in the earliest Greek manuscripts. So we have, for example, the King James version of the Bible. It, a given is in the, is in italics. Uh, New King James version still in italics. New American Standard Bible in italics. Uh, New American Standard Bible 1995 edition uh, no italics. Um, uh, 1977 edition uh, italics. Uh, Amplified Bible. Um, well, Amplified Bible, we know this to be a paraphrase, so I'm going to skip that. Um, and so, um, Christian Standard Bible, the italics is dropped. Um, uh, and then Holman Christian, Christian Standard Bible says, the Holy Spirit had not yet been received. American Standard Bible, not yet given. Uh, no italics. Uh, contemporary English version, the Spirit had not been given to anyone had not yet been given to anyone, which is an interesting way of putting it, because we know from the Gospel according to Luke that uh, many persons had already received uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, that, that's even before Jesus. So why there should be a cessation of uh, the you know giving of the Spirit this is not so very clear, and it's a puzzling verse in John's Gospel. So not yet given, not yet given, not yet. Uh, uh, well, not yet evident, according to God's word translation. The, the spirit was not yet evident. But, you know, all of these, all of these um, are, are, are just attempts to deal with uh, an anomaly in John's gospel here, where it says that uh, as of yet there was no spirit. That, that's literally what it says. As of yet there was no spirit. So the, somebody in, in a Greek trans, uh, a manuscript put not yet given. They're trying to smooth over this because how can you say that the, there was no spirit yet? And um, it's uh, obvious that uh, from John's perspective, uh, the, the spirit uh, is going to be another form of Jesus. So uh, Jesus coming back in another form. So it, that's why it will be said later on that it is essential for Jesus to go away for if he does not go away, the spirit cannot come. So Jesus is coming back as that uh, spirit. That's one uh, way of interpreting the gospel according to John. And this I find to be uh, common in the scholarly uh, literature. Uh, so uh, literal standard version says this, and this he said of the spirit, which those believing in him were to receive, for not yet was the Holy Spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now that's that's more to the point here. Um, International Standard Version says because the Spirit was not yet 
present as if he's somewhere else and not yet present. But of course, if he's the Holy Spirit, then you can't speak of the Holy Spirit being absent. Uh, just as you can't speak about God being absent, you can speak about the human Jesus being here and not there. Uh, but the Spirit, uh, that seems to be very odd. And Net Bible, now he said this about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were going to receive, for the Spirit had not yet been given. I'm very disappointed about uh, the Net Bible here, because this was supposed to be a very scholarly work. And um, uh, where did it get the given from? This is, uh, this is really uh, appalling. Uh, so, uh, in any case, uh, we find that uh, this uh, Bible Hub uh, list of uh, English translations of the Bible uh, has called together mainly conservative uh, Christian translations. And uh, in these uh, translations, uh, there's been a large attempt uh, to include a, a word like given uh, so as not to um, have it uh, have the anomaly so pronounced. Yet, we find a few like literal translations that uh, uh, reveal the problem. For example, Young's literal translation here on Bible Hub says, and this he said of the Spirit, which those believing in him were about to receive, for not yet was the Holy Spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So if uh, the, the Spirit is going to be another uh, form of Jesus, or Jesus in another form, uh, then uh, it, it, the, the Holy Spirit is not the third person of the Holy Trinity. At the most, you will have a binity uh, of Father and Son, with, with the Holy Spirit being another form of the Son, uh, and, uh, and that does not give you a trinity. So you can see, my friends, that uh, the doctrine of the Trinity uh, really is a very problematic one, and uh, it, uh, it, it, you know, what it behoves uh, our Christian friends uh, to uh, turn towards uh, the Unitarian um, uh, understanding of uh, Christianity, and by that I mean the biblical uh, Unitarian uh, understanding where the Bible interprets the Bible, and uh, we see that uh, there is only one God in, in that Bible, and, and that God is uh, God, what Christians call God the Father, the one whom Christians call God the Father. And uh, yes, the Bible says he has a son whose name is called Jesus, but uh, uh, that requires some explanation what is meant by the Son of God. And uh, definitely there is no way in which you can uh, identify the Holy Spirit as a separate and distinct person from the Father and uh, the Son. Sometimes it appears that the Holy Spirit is a designation for a spirit, a force that comes from God. And sometimes we see that the Holy Spirit, as in this case, uh, is a designation that uh, uh, is uh, closely related to the person of Jesus. But to have the Holy Spirit as a separate and distinct person uh, from uh, God the Father, uh, this uh, is not evidenced uh, by the uh, New Testament. Now, when we come to uh, what are called the Paraclete sayings uh, that I've already introduced, we will see that the Holy Spirit appears uh, a bit more personal, and there is a reason for that, especially in John uh, chapter 16. I don't uh, believe we have time today to elaborate that uh, fully, so I'm going to leave the Paraclete sayings uh, for now, and uh, we'll come back to it next week, God willing. We'll deal with the Paraclete sayings uh, particularly, in, in, more specifically, and in greater detail. But for now, let me wrap up the discussion of the Gospel according to John and his presentation of the Holy Spirit, apart from the Paraclete uh, sayings. Uh, coming uh, towards the end of the Gospel according to John, uh, Jesus is on the cross, and um, uh, at the moment of what would be, be the depiction of his death. Uh, the Gospel according to John says then that at that moment, uh, Jesus handed over the Spirit. So uh, that would show that Jesus, like the rest of us, has a Spirit. And uh, at the end of his life, what does he do? He gives up the Spirit, as the other Gospels say. But in John's Gospel, Jesus is more in control. Uh, it's not that, you know, like the Holy Spirit is wrenched out of him or something like this, or the Spirit of God that is there in human beings is somehow pulled out of him, but he gives it up. Uh, so he is in control. As the Gospel according to John has Jesus say, uh, I've been given the power to lay down my life and to take it up again. So he gives up uh, the Spirit. But, but the idea that he has a Spirit to give up, and that is the moment of his death, uh, this shows that he is like other human beings, and the Spirit that we're talking about here 
is not uh, the uh, a third person of the Holy Trinity. Lastly, I would mention that uh, when Jesus uh, is said to have resurrected from the dead and he met with his disciples, he then breathed on them and uh, said to them, receive uh, the Holy Spirit uh, or receive uh, Holy Spirit. Uh, one has to look at the very um, uh, close construction there in, in the Greek to be more precise about this. Uh, and if uh, God willing, if you um, are interested, then we can look more precisely at that. But uh, uh, here it is something that the disciples would receive and the disciples, uh, this is distributed into the disciples. And uh, if you, one is thinking, well, you know, the Holy Spirit, it would need he be there as a separate person uh, among the disciples, and he's talking to each one of them as an external um, reality that is um, guiding them and uh, telling them what to do. We don't find this actually happening in, in the remainder of John's Gospel. Uh, it is Jesus who comes back and uh, speaks to the disciples after this event and explains certain mysteries uh, to them. For example, uh, when they are puzzled about why uh, the beloved disciple um, is dying or, or has died. Uh, so Jesus comes and gives them the explanation. It's not like the Holy Spirit is an external reality. If at all, no, the Spirit is in these persons, these disciples of Jesus, it is giving them some kind of inner inspiration, but it is something that uh, they cannot uh, be absolutely certain about, and they still need that external uh, information that comes to them through uh, Jesus who now appears to them as is depicted in John chapter 21. So in, in short, uh, this brings us uh, uh, to a, a complete presentation of the gospel according to John's uh, depiction of the Holy Spirit, except for the paraclete sayings, which we'll have to come back, with, uh, come back to and deal with in more detail, and God willing, we'll do that uh, next week. And let me uh, remind you that uh, all of this helped my preparation uh, for a debate that I have coming up with uh, William Albrecht. This will be on the 28th of uh, February. Uh, so please uh, be sure to join me for that as well. The uh, precise timing and so on I'll announce. I believe it will be uh, towards the evening uh, of um, Jan uh, February 28th. So uh, more on that uh, later on. But for the moment, let me turn to your questions and comments, uh, ladies and gentlemen and uh, see uh, what uh, information and uh, thoughts you have for me in the comments. So, uh, just picking up again with Dennis saying everything is fine, and then we go to Hassan Osman. Assalamu alaikum from Nigeria, mashallah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brother Hassan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and protect you and all of the people of uh, Nigeria. Uh, Dennis, uh, audio and video, great. Thank you again, Dennis. And uh, Daniel Hashi, uh, Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam. Joyce Taylor with more salam, wa alaikum assalam, Joyce. And uh, Shadid uh, L, uh, salam and salam to you. Um, Jeremiah, Jeremy, Jeremy Redstreak, salam, Dr. Shabir. This is a fascinating and enlightening series. Thank you for, uh, so thank you for sharing. Um, oh, Nicodemus, Dean Crossley um, uh, corrects me on that. So uh, I was saying it's either uh, Nathaniel or did I mention Nicodemus? Maybe. Uh, but even if I haven't, Dean Crossley has got it for me. Thank you, Dean. That's why I like about forums like this, that, you know, I, instead of me studying alone um, and having to look things up uh, alone, uh, you are my helpers. Thank you all. And thank you, Dean. Okay, Michael, uh, Monarchian Trinitarianism answers your question. Okay, so Monarchian uh, Trinitarianism. Now, uh, uh, Michael, uh, so um, I'm not sure that Monarchian Trinitarianism is is the is the answer to this. I respect your faith, and um, uh, you know we, we we need to discuss that a little bit uh, further. In fact, I've been reading a book this morning uh, by uh, Bernard. Bernard, somebody. Um, he comes from the oneness Pentecostal uh, variety of Christianity. And, uh, and uh, they have a sort of monarchianism uh, where you, you have the one God who is manifest as the, as the Father, manifest as the Son, manifest as the Holy Spirit, but, but just one God. I, I believe that something like this is, uh, is what you have in mind. But, if, you know, if it's something different, please do to explain that um, uh, further for me. Um, 
I, I'm more inclined to think that the best explanation that I've seen um, among Christians for, you know, the, the relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the one that comes uh, from biblical Unitarianism. And you can look up their website, Biblical Unitarianism. Uh, there is also a, a website called God of Jesus, Jesus something, either .org or .com. And there is a book that actually is a hefty book uh, that um, uh, describes that uh, belief and shows the argument, uh, uh, the argumentation that supports that uh, that belief. Uh, okay, uh, Fatima Sultana, assalamu alaikum, sir from India, wa alaikum salam, sister Fatima, and uh, yet. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Mashallah. London is clear, alhamdulillah. And uh, as for uh, Toronto, we have a very cold weather today uh, in, in Toronto. And uh, of course, we're at the time of year when we should expect cold weather, nothing new about that. Uh, as for the uh, coronavirus, we are still uh, suffering from it. Uh, basically, the Toronto area uh, is uh, in a lockdown right now, so we're in lockdown 2.0, and we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us a quick and uh, complete uh, recovery from this lockdown situation so that things can reopen it in a way that is safe for us and pleasing to God. Okay, uh, Daniel, uh, the Spirit comes from the Father. Uh, okay, sure. And, and we see in the New Testament also in the passages that we have looked at, especially that Jesus breathes out the Holy Spirit. So John uh, chapter 20, Jesus appears to his disciples again, and he says, I receive you, the Holy Spirit, and then he breathes it out on them. So that means uh, the Holy Spirit comes from Jesus as well. And, and one has to wonder, and we will look at uh, the paraclete sayings in, in more detail, at which time we'll have more reason to wonder if there are actually two spirits. So uh, one that is associated with the Father, and just like the Father has a spirit, the Son also has a spirit, and that's another spirit, perhaps of a lesser uh, power, but it's not nonetheless a powerful spirit. And maybe uh, these are two different spirits and Christians have them both. I haven't seen uh, Christian commentators uh, uh, admitting to this possibility, um, but uh, it is a possibility that I'd like to explore. And we will look at that in more detail when we come back to deal with the paraclete sayings uh, next week, God willing. Okay, so um, Daniel uh, saying that's how we get baptized and how and and know him. Um, okay, so the spirit comes from the Father. You get baptized, and the spirit um, through the spirit you, you know the Father. Okay, uh, Dean Crossley. Any thoughts on the following two lines of argument that suggests uh, that the Holy Spirit is a person rather than a force? First, uh, there are uh, uh, first are the several verses mentioned earlier where the Holy Spirit is put in a coordinate relationship with the Father and Son. For example, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, 1 Corinthians, and so on. Okay, and since the Father and Son are both persons, the coordinate expression uh, strongly intimates that the Holy Spirit is a person also. Uh, second, there are places where the masculine pronoun, uh, he, uh, for, uh, in, in, the, in the Greek, ekenos, uh, is applied to the Holy Spirit, John chapter 14, 26, and so on. So these parakly sayings, um, uh, Dean, I'm going to look at next week, so I'm going to have more to say about that, which one would not expect from the rules of uh, Greek grammar for the word spirit, uh, because in Greek, this is pneuma, uh, is neuter, not masculine, and would ordinarily uh, be referred to uh, with the neuter pronoun ekeno. Uh, however, uh, moreover, the name counselor or comforter, uh, parakletos, is a term uh, com uh, commonly used to speak of a person who helps or give comfort or counsel uh, to another person or persons, but is used of the Holy Spirit and John's Gospel in uh, these uh, various places. Okay, so let me say some general comments about that, knowing that we're going to come back and deal with the paraclete sayings in some, uh, in some detail uh, next week, so I'll have more of a chance to explore all of the nuances uh, there. But uh, the 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 Holy Spirit. Some have uh, argued that the uh, the the Paraclete sayings that um, are are in John's Gospel um, initially, when when before the composition of the Gospel according to John as it is now, uh, these sayings were being bandied about, and and they had a a, a reference to a male salvific figure who will come in the future. 
And uh, this has been mentioned by uh, some pr prominent uh, and, and, and well-recognized uh, biblical scholars, such as, for example, Hans Windisch. I believe R Rudolf Bultmann said something like this as well, but I, uh, next week we'll have more um, clarity on that uh, and, and more specifics. Nonetheless, uh, important biblical scholars have said that uh, the initial reference to this, uh, prior to the Gospel according to John's composition, uh, was a reference to a male salvific figure. Now, we know in John chapter 14, verse number 26, it says uh, specifically and clearly the, Holy, uh, the, the Paracletos, the Holy Spirit. So in the Gospel, according to John, this now is a, a clearly a reference to the Holy Spirit. And, and only a, a, a detailed argument uh, can now try to reconstruct uh, what these sayings uh, were initially and could perhaps support the, the Muslim argument uh, that the reference here was to not only a male salvific figure, but specifically the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But I'm not making that argument today, nor am I, am I going to be making that argument next week. I'm, I'm focusing here on the use of the term within John's Gospel. So the, the answer to your question about, like, why does the Holy Spirit appear to be masculine here? So, so that, that's one answer from biblical scholars. It's because this comes from a tradition in which this was a reference to a male salvific figure. And so naturally, the uh, male referent is, uh, is retained. However, uh, the, uh, we still have to deal with the presence of this in the Gospel according to John now. So uh, forget about what it was before the Gospel according to John was composed. Now that it is in the Gospel according to John, and the Holy Spirit is being referred to by, this male, uh, by these male grammatical terms. Uh, doesn't that mean that the Holy Spirit is male uh, uh, and, and therefore personal, uh, as opposed to um, being uh, neuter, neuter, uh, neuter, neuter, neuter uh, of the neuter gender, as uh, we would expect uh, the panuma to be in, in Greek grammar? Well, uh, even if you say that uh, the, um, the, the Holy Spirit is, uh, is going to be a male, um, uh, a, a, a designated by male terms, uh, that by itself does not mean that uh, this is um, uh, that this is uh, a, a person. Uh, so, what do we mean by person? A person must be an individual who is able to self-identify as somebody who is going to make a declaration: "I am the Holy Spirit." Like in the Old Testament, God says, "I am Jehovah. I am God." Um, so. Uh, one who has this kind of uh, self-consciousness and can speak to another uh, in this kind of external um, way of uh, communicating, one that is distinct as the communicator uh, from the one who is receiving the communication. Uh, in the case of the Holy Spirit, still we have uh, male, female, or neuter. Uh, the Holy Spirit is still something that is depicted as communicating from within the mind of the uh, of human individuals. And so the personality of the Holy Spirit does not actually uh, come out here. Um, so, so that's the difference. Now, uh, they, there must be uh, many things which to us are inanimate objects, but which are uh, designated uh, by male grammatical terms in Greek, but that is not uh, there, you know, using the male grammatical terms for them. Uh, does not by itself uh, indicate that these are um, persons. They could still be inanimate uh, objects. And I don't know enough Greek to cite you examples uh, right off the top of my head, uh, but, but I'm sure that the maleness of uh, like the grammatical terms is not an indication of the personhood uh, of the term, so of the of the um, item so designated. And so let me look at some other aspects of your question here, Dean. So. Uh, the verses where the Holy Spirit is uh, put in a coordinate relationship with the Father and the Son. For example, Matthew 28, 19, so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, uh, the fact that this is uh, um, conjoined like this, that this does not mean uh, that uh, the Holy Spirit is uh, automatically a, a person. We still have to see, you know, uh, if, if something is conjoined with uh, me, if I speak about... Uh, 
you know, if I say, may God protect me and my wife and my home, uh, well, uh, here we have uh, uh, coordinated myself, my wife and my home. So myself and my wife are clearly persons, but my home is not. Uh, my home consists of persons, but, but my home itself is, is not, a, not a person. So I, I don't see that this is a sufficient proof. You see, we, we, cannot, we cannot multiply divine persons beyond necessity. Occam's razor um, is, is a governing principle here. Just as we cannot uh, in, you know, invent gods beside, beyond necessity, and there is only one God, we, we should stick with one God. Now, Trinitarians say that there is one God, to be sure, we agree on that. Uh, but uh, Trinitarians, by saying that the Holy Spirit is a third person, in the Trinity uh, has to have a, a they have to have like clear indications that this is a, a distinct person otherwise they're guilty of uh, multiplying persons beyond necessity and once they do that for the Holy Spirit then what's to make them stop at the Holy Spirit like why I know they've stopped but but from a point of view of epistemology like how do you know what you know so how do you know that the uh, that there are only three persons? If you're going to uh, stumble upon another person just based on some vague indications, then there are vague indications about many other powers and principalities and and so on in in the Bible. So why not identify all of these as uh, persons within a Godhead that is made up of uh, more persons than just Three. So I think these are weak indications, Dean, uh, but we can discuss specific ones. Uh, you know, when you list the verses here, um, it will take time for us to go into them into greater detail. But if there's one uh, particular one that you feel that we need to deal with in detail, uh, please uh, cite the whole verse and, uh, and send it to me in the comments. I'll get down to it eventually, if time permits, and we'll do that as well. And if not this week, then God willing, next week. All right. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that deals with basically most of what you have said, uh, except that we need to come back and deal with the power fleet sayings next week in more detail. Okay, Dennis, New World Translation, John chapter 17, 7, verse 39, for as yet there was no spirit, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Thank you, Dennis. That is more literal. And uh, uh, Fred, uh, Monarchian Trinitarian, Trinitarian, uh, Trinitarian Tyrannism, I think you meant to type, is just uh, uh, a made-up concept to justify the false approach. Okay, uh, was it Fred who was asking about uh, that previously? Um, let me see, because now I find two different tones there about this monarchism. Um, okay, it was Michael. For, for, okay, so, um, okay, Fred, um, I know you you believe that so some people believe in in it and and you don't 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 so um i i, I would say let let's speak um respectfully about uh, the beliefs of others uh, I, I appreciate your right to not hold that belief and of course i don't hold that belief either and uh, i've explained it uh, already um uh, so, but but let's find ways of respectfully speaking about the beliefs of others, even beliefs that we don't accept and that we are trying to explain uh, to be incorrect. Uh, so let us explain it in a way that the person listening uh, can can continue to listen. They don't feel offended and want to stop uh, listening. Okay. Um, as we would like others to deal with us. I mean, there are people, as much as we are fascinated with our own beliefs and we feel that uh, our beliefs are right, if somebody is going to tell us that our beliefs are wrong, then we would want them to tell us in a way uh, that, that is easy for us to digest. Okay, uh, so Amino, very nice to watch and listen to you. God bless uh, your family. Thank you, um, Amino. And uh, Michael, no, monarchianism, uh, monarchian Trinitarianism is not what J. Dyer aspires to and prominent uh, belief among uh, church fathers. Okay, uh, thank you, Michael. So if you have further details about what monarchianism Monarchian Trinitarianism um, um, entails, then, um, oh, uh, Monarchian Trinitarianism is what Jane Dyer aspires to. Okay, I understand now. Okay, I, uh, okay, I got it. 
So there, there, there's a Trinitarianism uh, that, that does not um, uh, so much emphasize the distinctiveness of the persons, but uh, they emphasize uh, the, the monarchy of the Father. Okay, so this is something I need to understand a little bit more. You know, when uh, I debated with Jay Dyer, uh, that uh, plunged me a little bit deeper into uh, Eastern Orthodoxy and uh, the Orthodox uh, depiction of the Trinity. Uh, but it is something that I need to study in some more great uh, detail. I uh, uh, watched some uh, videos of uh, a, a certain um, uh, a, a expert on the subject of uh, uh, the monarchy of the father uh, following the uh, J. Dyer debate, and, um, and, and that got me a little bit more schooled about that subject. But still, I need to uh, study that some more. And uh, thank you, Michael, for bringing that uh, uh, into my horizon again. And, and modalism, you're right, is different from that. That's not that's not modal, modalism. Uh, so uh, so far, as I understand it, so whereas uh, um, uh, the uh, in evangelicals uh, uh, in evangelical circles, the, the personhood of the three uh, persons are, are are stressed. It looks like in the monarchian uh, trinitarianism. Uh, the monarchy of the Father as the origin and, and the source of the Son and the Spirit is stressed. And so the, the Son and the Spirit appear to be some kind of emanations uh, from, from the Father. And uh, uh, so correct me if I'm wrong here, but that is the key difference with uh, monarchian uh, Trinitarianism. And, uh, and it is something that I will be studying in some more detail. Okay. So, uh, and perhaps I may have another debate with Jay Dyer uh, so that we can explore these uh, matters uh, in greater detail. Okay, Dennis, the only verse that made me think about the Holy Spirit being a person is John chapter 16, verse 13. That is what we will deal with next week. From all other uh, verses, it seems to be clear that the Spirit is not a person. Thank you, Dennis. And yes, we'll deal with that uh, next week. But as you brought it up, uh, let me just say for the moment that... Uh, if we have the presentation of the Holy Spirit in, in you know, the Old Testament, in the rest of the New Testament as being some kind of impersonal force, and then in this one place we have it, that, G, that this Spirit has a kind of personality, uh, then uh, that does not make the Holy Spirit a full person, like uh, having him as a semi-personality or, or a personality for a moment, you know, nowadays we, we have ways of thinking about intelligence. Um, there is artificial intelligence. Uh, so uh, an, uh, an artificial in, uh, uh, um, artificially intelligent machine uh, could be intelligent for a moment, but could be turned off tomorrow. And, uh, and so we have here the emergence of a personality, and um, uh, the, it can develop. It can develop to, you know, from a... Uh, simple computer system to, you know, an artificially intelligent computer system, and then it could be, again, back to uh, that, that, that artificial intelligence could be turned off. So we can think of something having a momentary uh, personality, uh, but that momentary personality or the personality, as in this case with the Holy Spirit, if he's coming back as Jesus in that specific role and he has a personality within that specific role, uh, then uh, that uh, uh, that by itself does not mean that this is a, a third person of the Holy Trinity, like a person, because to be a third person of the Holy Trinity, you have to have that personality from all eternity and for all eternity, from, uh, for all eternity. And then how much of a personality are we speaking about here? It's because it says that uh, he will not speak of his own, but he will declare what he hears. So as someone who will hear and then declare, well, our computers do that too. I mean, uh, my, my computer has an input, it's hearing what I say, and then it is broadcasting over the internet somehow, I don't know how the technology works here, um, uh, so that you can hear it at your end. And so it's hearing and, and it's declaring, and it's not speaking anything of its own, it's just declaring what it heard in the first place. The, the input is the same as the output. So in that case, where's the personality? So the, even the, the verses which have been um, touted as uh, verses indicating the personality of the Holy Spirit, especially this one, as you mentioned, Dennis, 
um, and, and I know you're somewhat agreeing with me on this, or I hope so. Um, uh, so, so I'm not disagreeing with you, but I even this one, uh, John chapter 16, verse 13, uh, still is not quite there depicting uh, the Holy Spirit as uh, a person enough to be the third person of the divine uh, uh, trinity, uh, according to Trinitarian belief. Okay, so uh, Walter James, uh, Salam Alaikum, Dr. Shabir, just wanted to uh, try to understand how the Christian brothers uh, believe that, uh, that the Holy Spirit is a human, when they clearly said in the New Testament that the Holy Spirit was in uh, the womb of uh, Elizabeth, uh, the mom of John the Baptist, uh, a relative of Mary. So, of course, um, uh, Christians uh, don't say uh, that uh, the Holy Spirit was a human, do they? Holy Spirit become a human? No, no, they don't say the Holy Spirit was a human. Um, but let me see if you if I understand your question more correctly. I uh, just wanted to try to understand how the Christian brothers believed that the Holy Spirit is a human when they clearly said in the New Testament that the Holy Spirit was in the womb of Elizabeth. Um, no, so so what they, what they mean somehow is that, that the Holy Spirit comes into a human. So, you know, was there perhaps in the in the womb of uh, of Elizabeth, um, not not um, as a as a human, but in the human person, John John the Baptist. That that's that's what they're saying. So so this creates a sort of a puzzle. Uh, so uh, let, let's say uh, you know, as a human being, can be presumed to have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Now, soul and spirit may be the same thing. Maybe that's the same as mind. Uh, you know, this is a philosophical problem. How do we distinguish between mind, uh, soul, and, and spirit? And even the mind, is the mind uh, just an epiphenomenon of the brain, or is this a separate reality? And, and so how to account for that? If, uh, you, you, like what's the difference between body and mind here? There, there's certainly a body-mind connection, but, uh, but what is that connection and so on? So all of these are mysteries. But, but let's say the human being has a spirit, and, and that's how we all speak. We, we human beings, we have a spirit. Okay. Um, so now the, the spirit of God comes into Christians. So the Christian can say, you know, I have God in my heart. And even if they say it's the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Son of God is in, is in my heart or is, or is in me. Uh, then does that mean you have two spirits in your body? You have the Holy, Holy Spirit and you have the spirit of the Son of God as well. Um, so these are, these are mysterious things, but uh, uh, more to our point is uh, whether or not the Holy Spirit can be considered a distinct person, and uh, this we did not uh, find a good explanation for. Okay, Dennis, uh, interesting thoughts about the person. There is a point that I wanted to, want to add. A person has a name, but in the Bible, the Holy Spirit doesn't have a name. The name of the Father is Jehovah, the name of the Son is Jesus. But yeah, it doesn't seem like the Holy Spirit has a name, like because uh, spirit is, is a kind of creature. So, so uh, well, let's not say creature here to, uh, uh, to decide the, the issue. But let's say a type of being. A type of being is called a spirit being. So angels are that type of being. They're spirit beings. God is said to be that type of being. God is a spirit. Uh, and, and this is where, uh, as a Muslim, I hesitate because uh, for, for Muslims, God is a sui generis. He's not a, a type of creature. He's only one of his type, let's put it this way. Uh, there, there is no other like him. The Quran says, Lam yakullahu one ahad. There is none equal to him. Laysa kemithlihi shay. There is nothing like him. Uh, so, so God is by himself uh, one of a kind. Uh, but in the Bible, it says God is spirit. Okay, so um, now God is a spirit kind. Um, but angels are of the same kind. Even devils are of the same kind. They're also of the spirit kind. Um, so spirit by itself is not a name. Spirit is just is saying this is one of one of a spirit from a, from the world of spirits, uh, and and calling him holy um, uh, is is just an adjective. An adjective. This one is holy. That one is devilish. This one is holy. This one is evil. Uh, so this one is holy. Okay. So this one is a holy spirit. 
um, saying the Holy Spirit doesn't help matters because sometimes the definite article is used uh, when we have one specific thing in mind, even though there could be many of those things. We can say, you know, uh, Joe Biden is the president, um, but uh, it, it doesn't mean that he is the only president in the world. It means that within a particular context, we're thinking of him as the president, uh, as the one, but uh, but there could be many other presidents in many different countries, uh, and uh, we're not just concerned about that at the moment. Even in America, there has been and there will be other presidents, but for the moment, we're focusing our minds on that one by saying the uh, president. So uh, speaking of the Holy Spirit with the definite article um, does not mean that there is only one Holy Spirit. There are many spirits in the Bible, and um, uh, certainly uh, some of these are evil and some of these are holy. So there are many Holy Spirits, as Clint Tibbs has uh, pointed out in his article and on uh, his uh, book on, on the subject. So you're right, Dennis, the Holy Spirit does not seem to have a name, uh, which um, a name by itself wouldn't prove personality. Um, like my computer has a name, um, you know, it has a brand um, and, and so on. But, um, and we can give it a name. We can give it a nice personal name. Um, you know, you can name your car something. Like if I, if I go pay for uh, parking using my uh, phone, an app on my phone, you know, my, my, my car, you know, I, if I have more than one car, then I would give each one a, a name. Uh, so that uh, I select the one that I'm paying for the parking for. So I give a name to my car, but it doesn't mean uh, that uh, my car, by having a name, is a person. So having the name does not prove personality, uh, but not having the name is a kind of a red flag. Like, uh, you know, um, it would be an unusual person who doesn't have a name, although that's possible too. I mean, there could be a John Doe. There could be somebody, you know, we found um, in a position, in, in a state of uh, amnesia, and, and we ask them their name, and they don't know their name. Maybe we don't even know they have a name. We can only assume that as human beings, uh, they must have names. Uh, but, uh, one, you know, the, the, if you have no proof the person has a name, that is not a proof of non-personality either. But it's, it's highly unusual. It's unusual that there, a person does not have a name. There has to be an explanation. Why doesn't this person have a name? And uh, so if the Holy Spirit is a person, third person of the Holy Trinity, the question is, yeah, why doesn't he have a name? And uh, more to the point, Dennis, you know, when, when Jehovah speaks, he says, I am Jehovah, I am God. Um, and then uh, Christians can um, um, find places where the Son is saying something like, you know, I and the Father are one. Before, you know, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And they cite all of these as proofs that Jesus was claiming divinity. We don't take that to be proof of Jesus' divinity or a claim to divinity, but nonetheless, when somebody is citing these verses, you can see the force of that and that this is a person speaking. Somebody is claiming self-identity. Uh, but uh, where is the Holy Spirit saying anything like that? Now, you might say, but because he's a spirit, he's not doing it. You know, how is the spirit going to speak? Well, the Father, too, is said to be a spirit, but, but he speaks, and he declares himself to be the only God. So why not the Holy Spirit? Uh, unless the Holy Spirit is some sort of a force emanating from God, and it's not an individual uh, in, in his own right. Okay. Uh, Dean Crossley, these are the verses noted previously, so uh, therefore go and baptize that one we have dealt with. And 1 Corinthians, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. Uh, there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all uh, of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. So uh, the Holy Spirit distributing something. Now we can have uh, an, an internet um, connection that is distributing uh, the, the flow of traffic. I don't know if I'm using the right terminology here, but I think you can get the point. Um, you, you can see I'm not very tech savvy. But if you have, if you have something that is distributing, uh, like, you know, you, you have, like there is a flow, even, even if there's a water flow, there's a flow of water, it comes to a central uh, terminal. And then from that central terminal, the water is being distributed to various cities. Well, you know, through various pipelines. Then uh, this... Um, uh, th this distribution 
uh, by itself does not prove personality. We're dealing here with impersonal forces and channels. So if the uh, spirit is distributing these gifts, uh, it, it doesn't mean uh, that the spirit is anything but an active uh, force or a channel through which God is giving his grace. Second Corinthians 13, 14, um, uh, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So fellowship of the Holy Spirit, like what level of fellowship? Because uh, if the Holy Spirit is kind of like a wind, that is here with us and comforting us, uh, then, you know, you can have a, a nice breeze that is giving you comfort and you feel some kind of fellowship from that. You feel the breeze is, uh, you know, rubbing up against you like, a, you know, a nice little furry kitten uh, against your legs or something like this. So you feel some comfort from that. Um, uh, it, it doesn't really prove the personality of the spirit. Like what would be different is, imagine how different it would be if you're sitting on, a, sitting on a park bench and the Holy Spirit comes and sits beside you on the same park bench and the Holy Spirit is having a conversation with you and says to you, you know what, uh, don't worry, I'm the Holy Spirit. So you look around, you're wondering like who's speaking with me here and, and you know that the voice is coming from outside of you, it's not just simply in your head. And, uh, and, and you move away some distance and you, the Holy Spirit is there sitting on the bench and saying, wait a minute, why did you move away? I'm still here. And now you're very clear that it's not just in your head. You can hear the voice coming from yonder. Uh, so uh, with, in the case of the Holy Spirit, we don't have any such dis depiction in, in the New Testament. So we cannot be sure that this is another uh, person who is speaking to uh, believers um, from from outside of them as an individual in his uh, or her own right. Um, so uh, Ephesians chapter 4 verses uh, 4 to 6, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and uh, through all and in all. So one spirit, so um, I, I think you will see, Dean, that this has nothing to do with uh, whether not one spirit is a person or, or not a person. It just uh, doesn't address the question. First uh, Peter chapter 1, verse 2, uh, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work uh, of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus uh, Christ and sprinkled uh, with his blood. Again, this does not uh, uh, prove that the Holy Spirit is a person. Uh, it, the Holy Spirit is something that sanctifies uh, people. Uh, we can say that, uh, you know, this acid is doing some work uh, as acids are, are supposed to do. But so the acid is doing some work, maybe eating through metal, uh, but uh, the, that does not prove that because the acid is doing some work, it is, um, it is uh, personal. We can say that this detergent is, uh, is working well in, in cleaning clothes and getting rid of dirt, but uh, that doesn't mean that the detergent is uh, something personal. And uh, so saying that the Holy Spirit is, um, is uh, doing some work in sanctifying uh, Christians, uh, this does not prove that the Holy Spirit is a, an individual, a person, um, as, as we would expect uh, the persons of the uh, Trinity to be. So uh, thank you, uh, Dean, for taking the time to send us these verses. Uh, as they are, and um, I'm, I'm glad um, that uh, we were able to look at them. But in the future, we will look at other uh, passages. We haven't looked at the Pauline writings systematically yet, so we'll have to uh, take the Pauline writings as a whole to, to get into, in a, in a way, as much as we can, into the mind of Paul to see what Paul thought about the Holy Spirit. Did Paul think that the Holy Spirit is a, a separate, uh, like a, a, a distinct person? Uh, from the Father and or or the Son, uh, and and we'll we'll come to deal with that in a, in a further post, inshallah, God willing. Okay, Mario, uh, it's sad. Many Muslims I walk with uh, a Muslim scholar, and he told me the Holy Spirit is not Prophet Muhammad. He said if the Prophet was alive today, he would have uh, rebuilt them. He would have rebuilt them. I I'm not sure I understand that last part, Mario. So you're saying many uh, Muslims you walk with. Uh, it's sad. Many Muslims I walk walk with, work with maybe, uh, a Muslim scholar, and he um, told me the Holy Spirit is not Prophet Muhammad. He said that if the Prophet was alive today, he would have maybe rebutted 
uh, those who are claiming that the Holy Spirit is the Prophet Muhammad, uh, on whom be peace. Um, I'm sorry, I have to try to make sense of your statement here, uh, Mario. And um, if, if somebody says, well, as a Muslim, I look at those uh, statements in the Gospel according to John, and I see that other Muslims are saying, oh, this is a reference to the Prophet Muhammad, but I don't agree with that. I don't think this is a reference to the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, some, some Muslim scholars are, and, and some Muslims would, would be uh, honest people that way. They're looking at the statements and they're thinking, well, the statements as they are, you know, our Christian friends say, how could this be the Prophet Muhammad? It says that uh, the, the Holy Spirit is in you but Muhammad is not in you, and so on. So the, uh, some people may look at that and say, okay, it looks like the Christians are right, and um, we Muslims cannot really use this to prove that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is mentioned in these particular statements. Um, so, so there would be nothing wrong if a Muslim said that, no weakness in his or her faith or anything like that. It's just a question of the interpretation uh, of, of the Bible. Uh, but uh, I, I, I would also give against a, a superficial and uh, simplistic uh, attribution of uh, these statements to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a reference to him. Uh, um, what I argue for is a sophisticated uh, backtracking to look at what uh, Jesus, peace be upon him, may have said for these statements to be represented as they are in the Gospel according to John about this paraclete figure. And it's, it's in that detailed work of reconstruction that we can arrive at the idea that Jesus spoke about uh, a male salvific figure to come after him, and that uh, male figure is the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace. Um, so, Hussein, Salaam alaikum, wa alaikum salam. Mubez, is God outside time and space? Mubez, this is a philosophical question, and uh, I don't feel equipped to answer that question. But uh, it'll be interesting to discuss that as a subject, to, uh, to, to look at all of the complexities of the matter and various views uh, regarding that. But I can say just in, in brief that uh, many believers today, Muslims, Christians, Jews, are inclined to say that God is outside of space and time. But Peter Vardy and some other uh, scholars, for example, Peter Vardy in his book, The Puzzle of God, and uh, a more recent book, Peter Vardy and Judy Arliss, uh, uh, God, a Thinker's Guide, God, a Thinker's Guide, um, they, they argue for um, God who is somehow related to time. And I don't remember the exact details now, but uh, that is, uh, would be good for review. And maybe in a future post, I'll deal with this whole question of God being outside of space and time. And what does that uh, uh, entail? Okay, Musti, Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Shabir. Let, uh, please let me know the difference between the Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost. Actually, these are two designations uh, for the same uh, phenomenon. Uh, in in the Bible, and uh, you know, at a time when 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 the word ghost was was being used to mean spirit, uh, the King James version of the Bible uh, used the term the Holy Ghost instead of the Holy Spirit, and that has uh, remained a common um, uh, bit of terminology. Uh, but nowadays, most of the English translations of the Bible move away from that and say the Holy Spirit, because when we mention ghost today, people have the idea of. Uh, uh, you know, something that is um, scary. Okay, so Zahir, a Holy Spirit are new ideas uh, and uh, knowledge. Uh, you don't have any other choice because it makes you wonder where knowledge has been arriving mostly to humans, to human, not animals or other species. Okay, so Holy Spirit is the, is the you can say, the channel. Um, okay, so you're saying Holy Spirit are the ideas themselves? Um so the knowledge is coming to human beings, and this is called the Holy Spirit? Or you mean the Holy Spirit is the channel, uh, brothers are here, through which the knowledge comes to us? That's an interesting thought. Okay, as I hear uh, explaining more, it ever uh, makes you wonder why none of the prophets ever tell you simple things like the shape of the earth is round or uh, earth has gravity. Holy Spirit is like a gravity, and according to science, every atom has its own magnetic field. Uh, the Quran says uh, you... Uh, would never have a full knowledge of Holy Spirit because unseen always uh, in some way stay unseen. So you feel, uh, Zahir, that uh, when we speak about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about uh, the things like gravity and so on. Now, uh, there have been scholars who have said, not necessarily Muslim scholars, but Maimonides, most famous uh, 
um, among Jewish scholars, uh, said that uh, when we speak of angels, angels are various forces uh, in, in the world. And these are called angels in, in the Bible, but, you know, it's uh, the forces that God has put into play to effect certain um, uh, of God's um, purposes. Uh, so so that, that's an interesting uh, take uh, from Maimonides, and I see Zahir, it looks like you have something like that in mind as well. Okay, does, Zahir, does, does Holy Spirit need circumcision? Is it not a joke? It is not a joke, it is a serious matter. Well, that's... Um, Interesting, Zahir. I never thought about that. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, when we speak about circumcision, we're talking about a human uh, piece of skin. And, um, and, and obviously, the Holy Spirit is not uh, a human being. So I think the question does not really apply. I don't know if uh, Christians would like to say something different about that. But... Um, I think you need to rethink the question itself, Brother Zahir. Why, why, why you think this is a question? Okay, Lubika. Salam alaikum from Belgium. Mashallah, wa alaikum salam. And may Allah subhanahu wa protect you and all of the people of Belgium. Uh, Sister Lubika. And uh, Nadim Ali Shah Jilani. Salam alaikum. Matthew 12, 8 says, And the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Basically, its context is when Jesus' disciples were eating the ear of corn uh, on the Sabbath, and the Gentiles were putting down them and Christ comes uh, and justifies their action using, using David's example about uh, the bread he ate, which was uh, for the priest. My Christian friends say that Christ is Lord of the Sabbath, meaning he created the law of uh, Sabbath and gave it to Moses. This, uh, this, uh, this proves he is God. How do I refute it? Uh, it's interesting, Nadim, that I got this question uh, within the last uh, little while in one of my previous posts, either last Sunday or maybe uh, on Friday. Uh, but uh, just to uh, deal with this again very quickly, uh, the, the, the context shows that uh, the, um, what is called Son of Man here, it just simply means human being in this particular verse. Various verses can have the Son of Man meaning different things in different contexts. But in this present context, uh, Son of Man uh, refers to human beings in general. What Jesus is saying in essence is that uh, the this, this Sabbath is made uh, for the human beings. Uh, like the, the Sabbath is there to give a benefit to the human beings. It's there for the benefit of human beings. It's not that human beings are there for the benefit of the Sabbath. That's a very important way, way, way of thinking of this, because when, when, when uh, people are saying, this is the Sabbath, let's keep it holy, uh, then they're thinking, okay, well, let's sacrifice the humans for the Sabbath. So don't heal human beings on the Sabbath, or, or don't bother eating grain on the Sabbath, um, or, or you know, plucking the grains and whatever on the Sabbath, uh, because you have to honor the Sabbath. And Jesus is saying, no, you have to honor the human being. So let the human beings eat, let the human beings be healed, because the Sabbath is there for the benefit of the human being. It's not the other way around. It's not that the human beings are there for the benefit of the Sabbath. So the human being is the master of the Sabbath. So this is the meaning of the Lord, word Lord here. The word Lord uh, does not necessarily mean God. It, it, uh, Lord is an honor, honorific title. Uh, to this day, if you go into Greece uh, and you see somebody and you can just, uh, uh, you know, address that uh, man as courier, uh, uh, Lord. Uh, but it doesn't mean that, that um, you know, this is Lord God. It's just, it, it, the meaning is simply sir. And it is used like this in the Bible. Uh, Sarah calls Abraham Lord. It doesn't mean that she's calling him God, but uh, it's an honorific title, um, like, like the equivalent of our sir. So uh, master is the proper translation here. So the son of... Uh, Man is master of the of the Sabbath. Human beings are masters of, of the Sabbath. God gave human beings the Sabbath for their benefit. The Sabbath gave people rest from work. Uh, so, you know, otherwise people would work, 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 work all, uh, you know, 24 7, seven, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and 366 days in the year, leap year. And, uh, you know, human beings would get no rest. But by instituting the Sabbath, uh, that gave people uh, a, a rest from all of it, right? There's a day that you set aside, it's a family day, uh, just be with your family, take it easy, sit back, relax, study scripture, 
uh, think about uh, things of the life hereafter. Don't be caught up in materialism so much. So you have a day that is of benefit to the human beings. That's what it is. We don't have to preserve it to such an extent that you're going to sacrifice human beings, prevent human beings from picking things that they need to eat, or even from healing people on, on the Sabbath. Okay, so, um, Noor Dean, do Catholicism, uh, Catholicism, Protestantism, and Orthodoxy have the same faith on, on the Holy Spirit? Uh, there are some slight differences um, between Eastern and Western. So we have the Eastern Orthodox and you have the Western um, uh, Catholics and Protestants. There is a, a major difference in that um, the, um, uh, the Western Church added a phrase uh, to their creed as to say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Uh, but this filioque uh, phrase uh, was rejected by the Eastern Orthodox. They said we cannot accept that the Holy Spirit is proceeding from the Son because the Son is subordinate to the Father. And if we have the Holy Spirit proceeding from uh, the Son, that would make the Holy Spirit doubly subordinate. And, uh, and they could not accept that. And that led to the Great Schism in uh, uh, 1054 between the East and uh, the, the West, and it has not been reconciled. So this is a very important and significant difference uh, uh, between these two major uh, divisions. Okay, um, so you're saying because three is one, and uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that, Zahir, where, where, you know, how that connects with what we said before. Okay, Zahir, one needs circumcision, uh, other two not so one is circumcised, other two are obvious. Well, it's an interesting thing about the fathers, I hear, um, because, you know, when, uh, as one of our com uh, commentators said here already, um, uh, the Holy Spirit in Greek is, is uh, neuter in, in, um, in, in the, our Semitic languages, in, in Hebrew and Aramaic, uh, the word for spirit, roach, is feminine. Um, but where we have um, uh, the uh, father is spoken of as, as father, definitely this is male. And um, uh, I mean, in, in, the, in the biblical presentation of God, God like seems to have a body and he is male. Um, so the question of circumcision of God, I think... Um, is something that, you know, I hadn't thought about, about it before you asked it, Zahir, but um, uh, I am sure that our Christian friends would have an answer for that. Um, yeah, it, it is a question that, that, that uh, now you've put in my mind, and I don't know the answer to that. What do our Christian friends say about the possible circumcision of the Father? Now, when Abraham received the command to circumcise, he circumcised himself and his uh, male um, like the, the males under his um, tutelage or, or um, patronage. And um, Jesus is said to have been circumcised on the eighth day. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a question. Anyway, um, I, I don't have the answer to that, Zahir. We'll have to ask our Christian friends. Moise, the kingdom of God is within you, according to Luke chapter 17, verse 21. What is the meaning of this verse? Moise, the, the idea, what is meant by the kingdom of God is a puzzle for Christians today. Uh, E.P. Sanders, in his book, The Historical Jesus, uh, gives uh, a, a variety of interpretations of what is meant by kingdom of God. And uh, these uh, variety of interpretations are supported by various references uh, in, uh, in the Bible. And, and it's, uh, it's not easy to pick one. It looks like each one has something going for them. And the reason why it's difficult to pick one is that the New Testament was written by a variety of persons who had different ideas about what is meant by the kingdom of God. Some of them thought that the, holy, the kingdom of God is something already happened, already in existence. Some thought that the kingdom of God is something that's going to be in the future. Something that the kingdom of God is a kind of an external reality in the world. Something that the kingdom of God is something that is inside the mind of the person. A kind of a state of, uh, of internal satisfaction or something like this. So uh, that, that, that is uh, a, a, you know, a depressing conclusion that we don't know what the kingdom of God uh, really refers to because the kingdom of God is shown to be something that Jesus was preaching about again and again. 
Like everybody agrees that Jesus was preaching about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. So you would expect that um, the earliest Christians would have grasped what is the kingdom of God, and they would have uh, given us a unified presentation on what is exactly meant by the kingdom of God. But uh, contrary to that, we find that uh, there is this remaining puzzle as to what exactly is the kingdom of God. Is it inside people or outside of them? Is it here now or is it coming in the future? Or is it both? Uh, you know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So it means it seems that various writers of the New Testament arrived at different conclusions. Maybe they didn't even arrive at different conclusions. But as the sayings of Jesus about the kingdom of God were being circulated, they took on different flavors, and these various flavors are reflected in the collected sayings uh, of Jesus as we find them in the four Gospels. Now, um, okay, so. Um, uh, Dennis seems to have uh, a reply to this. Uh, Dennis is saying that verse can also be translated uh, is in the midst of you, and Jesus is the coming king. Therefore, uh, Jesus represented that coming kingdom and was in the midst of the Pharisees. Okay, interesting. I will um, perhaps uh, deal with the question of the kingdom of God as a separate presentation eventually one day. But there you have some food for thought for the moment. Nadim Ali Shah Jilani, uh, should I take BA in Islamic studies uh, or BA in biblical studies? Which one would you recommend? I love you, Professor, and I always make to offer you. Thank you, Brother Nadim. May Allah SWT bless you, and uh, may Allah SWT reward you and uh, all of your loved ones. Okay, so uh, which one is preferable? Um, Brother Nadim, I cannot um, give you a prescription here. I can only say that both of these are important uh, areas of study, and uh, it depends on what you want to do with it uh, in, in your life. If you want to you know, do more comparative religion work, then it'd be good to get the BA in biblical studies. If you want to do, if you want to understand Islam more deeply, even if you want to do comparative religion work, it's necessary to get a good grounding in Islam as well. Maybe you need both. Um, so, um, some, some people, like most people, just study their own religion and uh, they know it well, and then if they get into a discussion with others, at least they know one thing, they can represent the Muslim side. Uh, often we see people who are in comparative religion, they don't understand Islam very well, and so when they get into discussion about uh, discussions about comparative religion, uh, they're neither here nor there. They don't understand the other religions well, because, you know, if you're, you're studying another religion, you're not going to know it as well as, your, as you know your own. You, you see me here. Um, you know, I do know a few things about the Bible by the grace of God, but when I speak, I don't know the Bible uh, in detail as uh, many of our Christian friends here do, because uh, when they read the Bible, that's what they, that's their, you know, that, that's their breakfast, uh, lunch, and dinner. Uh, they're, you know, that, 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 that's, that's what they do. Uh, but for me, it's kind of cursory. I, you know, I, I spend a lot more time with the Quran. I memorize the Quran and, and so on. Our Christian friends may have a cursory knowledge of the Quran, but they, they, they won't bother to get into such detail with the Quran, just as I do not bother to get into such detail with the Bible. So we'll know some things to cursorily, and uh, the faith that we have is the one that we're totally immersed in. So most likely you're going to know your own faith better. Uh, so if you're in comparative religion and you only know the other faith and you know that superficially, and you don't know your own faith well, so you're neither here nor there. You're neither representing your own faith well, nor are you really making any inroads in building understanding with, with people of the other faith. So sometimes it's better just to know the one faith. So take the BA in Islamic studies. At least you know your own faith and you know it thoroughly, and you can represent that in a public uh, discourse. But, you know, we have a short life and we can't learn everything. We can't be specialists in everything all at once. So sometimes we have to make choices. So it depends on how you're going to use this information. And, uh, you know, you can make that decision yourself. There's certainly a great need for Muslims to uh, know comparative religion because we'll go to the mosque, we'll hear sermons, uh, we'll read the Quran on our own, we'll get some uh, knowledge of Islam, but uh, we're, uh, many of us Muslims are totally uh, blanked out when it comes to uh, knowing something about the uh, other religions, and uh, and this places this uh, this places us at a significant disadvantage because there are many people out there who are studying Islam, and many are studying Islam for the purpose of trying to refute it. 
and, uh, and and we need to step up uh, and 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 be ready in that world of discourse in which some people are trying to disprove Islam from the outside. So uh, to get into this realm of discourse, it is important for us to uh, get this kind of comparative knowledge. So in that case, a BA in uh, comparative religion or biblical studies uh, would would be appropriate as well. So uh, you know, I, I know I'm not giving you a definitive answer here, but uh, you can be the best judge of. Um, how to proceed from there. Okay. Um, Zahir in, insisting on his uh, question here. Sir, it is a serious question because it tells you there are certain powers even Jesus did not have. Uh, okay. Um, I'm not sure that you're, uh, are you referring to the same thing about circumcision, Zahir? I'm not really sure what you're referring to. Okay, Mubez, uh, is morality subjective or objective? Uh, Mubez, it seems to me, and this requires another discourse as well, that uh, uh, morality, there's a certain subjective element and there's a certain objective element as well. Just the idea itself of morality, this has to be objective, because if the idea that morality is something good that we should all have and so on, uh, is only subjective, then the question is, why should we even bother with morality at all? Uh, but uh, if there's a certain objective core, uh, then at least we can say that uh, morality has some basis, uh, and uh, that basis is God. God is the uh, source of our moral sense, and therefore we must respect that sense, and we must strive to be good moral uh, beings. Okay, Fatima Sultana, sir, did the Holy Spirit appear to Jesus, peace be upon him, near family members? If yes, why didn't we find a book by them? And if no, then how come the family members of Jesus were left? And after many years, the Spirit appeared to someone who did not even see him. Yeah, Fatima, this is a very important um, question here. Uh, like, why do we not have um, um, narratives from um, Mary, let's say, directly? Now, what was Mary literate? Uh, uh, she, she, you know, she was with child when she was very young, and did this hinder her education? Um, certainly, even as a child at that time, I mean, even um, even in her early teens when she became pregnant, by that time, you know, many children already learned to read um, and, and write. So, um, uh, could she not have written something herself? to give us first-hand information about her relationship with her son. And uh, even if somebody else is writing, you would expect that people will go to Mary and say, oh, uh, Mary, uh, how do you feel now that uh, your son has risen from the dead and he's appearing to everyone else? Uh, by the way, did he appear to you also? So we'd get a first-hand account from Mary herself about her experiences with her son. But we don't have this. We have third-hand accounts. We have like Mark's gospel telling us that uh, Mary was coming to take Jesus away for, uh, from his preaching in public because uh, she thought uh, that uh, he was beside himself, which means that she thought that she, he was somehow uh, possessed by, by a certain spirit. Um, so, so we would have, you know, today we crave this information from the, um, not only the original disciples of Jesus, but the family of Jesus. Now we have in the New Testament uh, a book, uh, you can say a letter, attributed to James, but uh, which, who is said to be the brother of the Lord. But uh, you know, scholars today think that this is not the actual uh, James writing this. This is somebody writing in the name of James. We have Jude, who is said to be of James. So what does that mean? Does he mean the brother of James and hence the brother of Jesus as well? At least his half-brother. Uh, or son of James, in which case it would mean that this is Jesus' nephew. But here, too, this is uh, said to be one of the last books of the New Testament to be written, and probably written in the name of this uh, family uh, relative of, of Jesus. So we don't have the original writings of these um, uh, persons, and, uh, um, and or even direct accounts of somebody writing down their uh, memoirs. Uh, so I think that's a very important question. Whereas, as you know, in, in uh, Islam, at least we have, um, uh, at least there is a claim. It, I mean, the authenticity of the hadith is another matter, but at least Muslims seem to have that orientation that, yes, if to get the authentic information, we have to get it from the original people who lived and walked with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his close companions and his uh, family members. 
Okay, Nadim uh, Ali Shah, uh, thank you, Professor, and Muhammad uh, Sajid Hussain, Salam Sheikh. Can we pray Salat in languages other than Arabic? Could you describe a little bit about the fatwa of Imam Abu Hanifa regarding it? So, Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, is noted in the uh, tafsir of Imam al Qurtubi, rahimahullah, uh, to have permitted people to uh, pray in Persian. Not only did he permit it, but he said that it is better that they pray in Persian uh, because uh, then their, their words would be more meaningful. Uh, to them. No time for me to elaborate further, my brother, um, because I want to end this uh, very soon now. Uh, Dean Crossley, your previous responses I hear about educational options uh, prompted another question. Are you aware of any Muslims who have published academic commentaries on the New Testament? Um, there is. There is uh, um, Shahid Akhtar. Akhtar. Um, he has written on Galatians. I think his name is Shahid Akhtar. Um, so, so look for that, and I think there's more than one work that he has put out. This is an academic work on the New Testament. Somebody had also contacted me, and they sent me a portion of uh, their work on the Gospel according to Mark. Uh, they started uh, a, a work to produce Mark with uh, a, a very detailed scholarly apparatus and reference to uh, Greek and Aramaic in, in, in that uh, commentary. Uh, I, I haven't seen the completion of that work, and um, I hope that they will com complete it because that will be a very uh, important contribution uh, to scholarly uh, discourse. Okay, um, so Stephen saying Mark was a protege of Peter. So it is believed, Stephen. And by the way, hello, Stephen, my good friend. Um, uh, so um, some uh, early Christian scholars said that, for example, uh, Papias said that, but Papias was writing in the middle of the second century. Uh, we cannot be sure that he had um, uh, direct information about this. It may be that uh, uh, Christian scholars at his time uh, thought so, but uh, like, what's the origin of that thought? This um, uh, requires further investigation. Uh, Moves, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. If I do not go away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. From Quran, we know that Jesus, that we know that it, it is God who sends messengers. Um, but in this verse, I, Jesus, will send uh, unto you. I'm getting confused, please answer. Moves, in fact, uh, this matter is confusing even for Christian commentators. And the next week, God willing, when we deal with the Paraclete sayings, we will see that Raymond Brown, uh, one of the great commentators on the Gospel according to John, shows that uh, uh, there are varying statements about this. Among these uh, statements in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, one moment it says that the Father will send the, the, uh, the, the Spirit. Another moment it says that Jesus will send the Spirit. So which one is it? Um, uh, so it, it needs some further clarification, and God willing, we'll look at that next week. I want to end at this point. So uh, thank you all for joining me. Please uh, support my humble uh, work and mission by going to our website, islaminfo.com. That's where you can send a donation, and uh, that helps uh, our mission to continue so that we can broadcast messages like this and we can continue with uh, our mission on the whole. Our mosque is now closed, and so our usual collection in the mosque has dwindled, but I'm counting on folks uh, from around the globe who have been joining me on these um, uh, public discussions uh, to help us to continue our mission. Our mosque needs funding, our mission needs funding, and uh, you are the people who can help us to do that because you are in contact with us and benefiting from the knowledge that we are uh, sharing. So we'd like to continue to do this, and uh, we would like you to also do your part because it takes two hands to clap. So thank you all for joining me. I pray that God will protect you all, protect all of your loved ones, keep you all safe from the COVID uh, uh, illness, from every other sick, sick, sickness and disease and distress and stress. May God protect us from the virus that causes it and even from this new strain that we hear about or whatever strains there are uh, out there, already out there or uh, lurking in the background. May God protect us all from all of those and uh, keep us hale and healthy and uh, in good spirits and a high state of faith in him. May God lead us to that faith which he wants us to accept for his salvation. I want to thank you all for joining me. I respect you all. I love you all. Uh, thank you again. Join me next week when we'll continue this discussion on the Holy Spirit. Next week we'll look at the Paraclete sayings in John chapters 14, 15, and uh, 16. And um, that will uh, help my preparation for uh, my uh, debate coming up on February 28th with uh, William Albrecht, 
on uh, the very subject. Uh, is the Holy Spirit uh, a divine person distinct from the Father and the Son? And in fact, I have some other debates coming up as well, which you'll hear about in due course. Uh, I'll be de debating a little bit on. Uh, on uh, two related topics uh, about the crucifixion uh, of Jesus. Uh, one uh, th is the Quranic depiction of the crucifixion um, uh, coherent, and two uh, is the biblical depiction of the crucifixion uh, coherent. And uh, I will be deb debating with uh, Andrew Loki, or I don't know how to say his last name correctly, maybe Loki. Uh, Andrew Loki from Hong Kong, and this will be uh, in, in, coming uh, up as well in the in the coming months, uh, and that will be on the resurrection of Jesus. Andrew Loki is a true scholar. He has uh, written a number of very important books, one on the topic of the resurrection of Jesus. So that will be an important and informative uh, debate between me and him. I will certainly learn uh, from all of these debates, and I hope that uh, you might learn something as well, or you might teach us something through your interaction uh, via question and answer. Uh, in any case, do tune in, and I hope to be with you in all of these programs. So next week, God willing, same time, 12.30 p.m. Uh, Sunday here on my Facebook page, Eastern Standard Time. And before that, for those of you who would like to join me for my Friday sermon, virtual sermon will be on Friday at 12.30 p.m. Uh, Toronto time. God bless you. Uh, God be with you all. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you.